And his commitment was very simple. I had this $1 billion. I was worth $3 billion at the beginning of the year. Now I'm worth four. And I want to give that $1 billion to the UN. We were not sure whether he really meant it or not. I, I remember Kofi Annan saying, Did he say a million or a billion? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, No, sir. He said billion with a B. Hello and welcome to the Difference Makers podcast, brought to you by Chartered Accountants Worldwide. I'm your host, Indy Hoti. In this series, we're going to meet with leaders, many of whom are at the very peak of their influence and achievement, and some who are making their mark on the world despite their relative youth. They all share the view that the world can be a better place, and that they can and should do something about it. They're all Chartered Accountants. In this episode, we hear from Amir Dossal. Amir is a 25-year veteran of the United Nations and was a UN's chief liaison for partnerships. As executive director of the UN Office for Partnerships, he managed the one billion gift by media mogul Ted Turner. We hope you are inspired by Amir's story. One of the aspirations I had when I was a kid was, how can I become a pilot? I used to see planes fly by and think, why, how did they ever get up in the sky? So I was really keen to be a pilot. And of course, you realize that over a period of time, your aspirations change, your desires change. And I thought, no, you know what? I'll do something else. Uh, Maybe I'll be a teacher because uh, you buy your teachers who look after you teach you and train you and guide you. Not all the teachers, mind you, but you felt that being a noble profession, I could do that. Fast forward a few more years. My mother used to run a Canadian store, a grocery store. And I used to help her with buying supplies, buying the goods, going to the wholesale market. And then actually helped her calculating profits on a income, sales, and so on. And then my mom and dad realized, whoa, this guy can add things, and subtract things. So why don't you go into finance? I, they said, why don't you study maths? And I got excited about it. I was growing up in Karachi, in Pakistan. My father said, only place where you can study is in England, in the UK. You should go there. He had grown up in Sheffield, so he was keen that I study there. He said, that's the best education system. So I said, okay. Uh, and he said, you don't want to be in the cold part of the country, be in the south. So, <laughs> so I, I was very fortunate. I spent two and a half years in Bournemouth. In those days, you could transfer articles. And I wanted to go into London. Moved to London and you got exposed to a larger firm. And Admittedly, I was focused on saying, the day I qualify, the day I'll get rich. Because suddenly your <laughs> income goes from £4.25 a month <laughs> to about uh, £200 a month or £300 a month. I, so I was keen on starting with that. At the same time, I realized that it was not easy when, when you were trying to struggle with that amount of money and you saw poverty in different parts of the world. So I felt at some point in time, I'd love to do something that, I'm sorry to use the cliche, where I can do well and do good in the process. I stayed on the profession for a little while, and then I went into civil engineering. So I became a financial controller for the top civil engineers in London. Huge amount of projects around the world. And that's when the time I realized that, okay, this is helping people improve their quality of life. If you, you're building bridges, low cost housing, city centers and so on. And I felt it would be great if I could do something that can help me achieve both dreams, do well and do good. And that's the time I started looking around. So it was really 10 years into my work as a child of the company that I hit a lucky break. My brother-in-law was getting married in New York. 
I said to him, I'd love to meet somebody from the UN. And he said, oh, as it so happens, at my stag party, you'll meet some people. And I met them and I talked to them and they, they said, well, yes, good idea. Uh, thank you for thinking like this, but we don't have anything for you. So this is 1984. In 85, we were back again on holiday. And that's when I tried them again. And they said, come in for an interview. So in those days, UN was doing quite a lot of good work uh, on the, in the humanitarian sector. UK was one of the strongest supporters and partners of the UN. So I felt I'd like to have a go at that. And, and I also looked at, by the way, Save the Children in those days, because that was another great organization. It still remains one of the premier institutions around the world to help children live better, uh, healthier lives and so on, educate better. I, so you, you kind of fell for that kind of, kind of thing. So when we were growing up, it wasn't as if uh, I grew up with a silver spoon. So I had to work, work for a living. And we didn't have that much money, a little bit of middle-class background. So for four years of article ship, it was a rough ride. And I, I guess I never forgot the fact that I had to struggle for it. My parents had to struggle for it. And then you saw poverty around you. In the Indian subcontinent, for example, and then you look at Africa, similar things going on. And of course, at that age, you're not worldly wise. You're, you're just seeing what you see in front of you and you extrapolate that. And then you grow and learn from conversation and news and research and so on. And it took me from the time I graduated you know, as a chartered accountant in 1975 for at least that five year period when I felt, OK, I, now I can live like a king. I'm getting decent salary and so on. I felt that there, there are other things I can do. I, I'm not, I should not be just focused on the bottom line. Bottom line is great, but how can you help companies do well and do good? And that's how I started that process. I was actually 34 when I arrived at the UN. I took a cut in my pay when I was in London. I had a car, expense account, American Express card, all kinds of things. <laughs> and then I felt, okay, let me restart. I was quite happy to say, okay, I'll take a step back and learn something new and, and a, a, a new direction, which hopefully there was an opportunity to see something different. Initially, I was operational manager for UNDP. So it was a, a very small, minuscule contribution to the larger scheme of things. I spent only about five years doing that. And then I had an opportunity to work in the field itself as the deputy representative in the Caribbean region, covering five countries. That's when you get your hands dirty. You roll up your sleeves and you figure out what the country's development needs are. So I moved from being a chartered accountant to being an advisor on technical assistance projects. And I say advisor in the lightest sense because you would help guide the countries in, in the national development plan and the implementation of those plans. So you worked with World Bank and IMF and others bilateral aid agencies, DFID in those days, for example, USAID, etc. And admittedly, it's a huge learning process, but you realize if you put that into practical terms as to what you're looking to do, it's not complicated. It could be complex, but not complicated. You are so privileged, actually, when you're doing this kind of work, where you get the opportunity to learn what the challenges of countries are and hear them out. The most important thing is to have good listening skills to hear what they are looking for. For example, in Jamaica, if you went to medical facilities, they didn't have the right equipment. Well, the equipment also meant that they needed systems in place. And to have systems in place, you need to train people. So it was an entire systems-based approach. How do you capture data on epidemiology, for example, uh, non-communicable diseases uh, or transmissible diseases. And the moment you do health, you're doing education. And you're not doing education for, for adults, but you're also looking at children. Because if a child learns better, she or he knows how to be healthy, child is able to learn and earn better. It's a long-term process. This is not an overnight success item for any country, but you need that system which has been in place uh, you and I have been very lucky and lived in the society where you begin to expect things to work right. I also had the opportunity to spend five years in peacekeeping operation. 
And if you might recall um, the, the crash of Sarajevo, the Rwanda genocide, all of those things, those were uh, sorry situations the world was watching and seeing unfold in front of their eyes. And with it was what you'd call the CNN factor. You sat there, watched CNN and saying, oh my God, this, these countries are crumbling. And that's, it was 1997 actually, when Ted Turner came on the scene and he committed $1 billion to the United Nations. Thank you for uh, for caring about the UN and the principles of the UN too. It, it takes all of us. Uh, we're all members of a big team. I decided though what would be really exciting to do is I'm going to donate a billion dollars to the UN cause myself. And his commitment was very simple. I had this $1 billion. I was worth $3 billion at the beginning of the year. Now I'm worth four, and I want to give that one billion to the UN. We were not sure whether he really meant it or not. I, I remember Kofi Annan saying, Did he say a million or a billion? <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, No, sir. He said billion with a B. And we created a counterpart organization called the United Nations Fund for International Partnerships. And that actually changed the way the UN operated. With Ted Turner's funds, we were able to leverage others, other foundations, other donors, other companies saying we can do, we're doing well. We also don't want to do good. And by the way, we are doing good. Why don't we partner together? So that was a great opportunity for the UN and by extension for the underprivileged because they were able to benefit from more donations, more contributions, more expertise. In 2005, the MDG, the Millennium Development Goals, were adopted by the UN. And we struggled with it. And they had a lifespan of 15 years, and they, there were eight goals. We didn't make much progress. The international community did not make much progress. It became clear that we needed a new set of goals, which were developed in consultations with, with all the governments, but also civil society, also the private sector. And I felt in 2010 that I had done enough in terms of building partnerships, etc. And I wanted to focus on helping the UN from the outside in a small way to contribute towards that process. So it was an excellent way for companies and NGOs, nonprofits, foundations to come together and say, this is what we need in my country. We have a gap in our education structure. We have a gap in providing clean water, safe drinking water. We don't have very good health systems. So we must focus on these and put targets on them. Set up KPIs. So that consultation process started in 2010 and culminated in 2015 with the approval and launch of the Sustainable Development Goal. 17 goals and 169 targets. So we were part of the negotiation. We, we actually pushed for the creation of SDG 14, which is the Clean Oceans SDG. And in 2010, we created a not-for-profit called Global Partnerships Forum, whose mission is essentially to help the UN achieve the SDG. I, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm very, very grateful that I get the opportunity to learn about what so many people are doing. You, you learn about innovation, you learn about entrepreneurship. That's what keeps you going, actually. If you feel, oh, there's hope there. Hope for humanity that millions of people out there wanting to do things. The world needs leaders with vision, capability, and compassion. Some of those leaders will and do come from chartered accountants. Listen to other podcasts in the series on the Chartered Accountants Worldwide website and wherever you find your podcasts. If you like this podcast, why not take a moment to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever platform you listen on. It will really help us get the word out.